Aaron Wiesenfeld. Now, that name may not be familiar to a greater majority of you, or you may actually know Wiesenfeld for his latter-day fine arts paintings and gallery work. However, there are quite a few of us who still regard Wiesenfeld as one of the unsung comic book artists of the mid to late 1990s. I want to discuss his comics career here on this episode of Blurred It Out. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Blurred It Out. I'm your host, Adrian Johnson. And as I stated at the top of the episode, I want to discuss the brief comics career of Aaron Wiesenfeld. Um, before I jump into that, I would definitely love to remind you guys that if you like what you see here or anything else on the Anosm Studios channel, definitely feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Wiesenfeld is one of my favorite comic book artists. Um, as I also mentioned at the top of the uh, episode in the preamble, he's a name unfamiliar to a lot of people in terms of having done comics at all. I think many people know Wiesenfeld more for his fine arts work and gallery paintings, which are uh, just phenomenal. For myself with Wiesenfeld, uh, my first connection with him, perhaps for many others, is was through his comics work. So I wanted to take some time just to discuss it because I think when people, fans rather, when they're talking about, you know, 90s comics for good and ill, you know, they do kind of glaze over in terms of Wiesenfeld. Like, I feel like he's unduly left out of the conversation. And part of that may be just be just because he just did not do uh, a huge body of work back in the 90s. You know what I mean? Um, it was quite a few books in terms of it being a, a handful. You know, but just a handful of books are just still exciting. And they're worth your time to track down and really check them out. Because for as much grief as people give, you know, those 90s comics, and in some ways, rightfully so. I think Wiesenfeld's work, amongst others, um, is some of the best that was produced during that decade. Uh, Wiesenfeld, for me, really came into his own with uh, this particular book, Team 7. Now, I remember reading in Wizard Magazine about Team 7 at the time of its release and being really excited because, you know, I've always been a lifelong uh, military history buff, you know, really into, you know, uh, tactics and warfare and all that type of stuff, you know, and I didn't have any idea who Wiesenfeld was, but the opening image for that very first issue was just so arresting, just so striking. And, you know, it really just promised, you know, to just be awesome, you know, in terms of delivering on what the whole series would be. And so I recall picking up like that first issue and just really being blown away. Just like, whoa. Wow, this this is just so so man. I, and 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 looking back at it now, even when I read back through the uh, paperback here, the collection of it, it's very typical in a lot of ways of what was coming out of Wildstorm and perhaps that whole Image House style, you know, in particular. But I would also say within that first issue, what makes it very special is that. You see Wiesenfeld really doing some things that a lot of those other artists weren't doing at the time, you know, in terms of uh, perspective, uh, switching up styles, too. I mean, there's a couple of instances just within the first issue where it goes from being like this image style to, you know, you go into like this deep focus, you know, on this deep perspective and. You know, he's really doing some great things with that um, double page spreads and, you know, it's very detailed. But over the course of the series, you really see him start to spread his wings in terms of different influences. Like there are influences as uh, disparate as uh, Barry Windsor Smith in a couple of panels. Um, I saw some homages to uh, Frank Miller in particular, uh, Dark Knight Returns, so, and also some Mike McNola as well. And I think this adds, you know, to the effect of Wiesenfeld really finding himself um, more as an artist and in terms of finding his particular voice, you know, 
moving away from just that standard house style that he came in with. After Team 7 was released, Wieserfeld's star was definitely on the rise and he was starting to gain notice in the industry for his detailed work that metastasized into something very special. And that was definitely noticed there in the studio at Wildstorm. I got a copy of Wild Times, the oral history of Wildstorm Studios written by Joseph Hedges uh, late last year. Uh, it's a fantastic read and I highly recommend it. And part of the reason for my high recommendations, the interviews in here are just fantastic. And the way that they're put together um, pretty much chronologically throughout the history of the studio really makes it a fascinating read, especially for fans of Wildstorm Studios proper like myself. Um, but in here, there's actually a recollection by both uh, Chuck Dixon, the writer of Team 7, and J. Scott Campbell, one of the superstars out of uh, Wildstorm Studios, about Wiesenfeld's work as he began turning in pages on Team 7. Chuck Dixon, quote, They trusted me and Aaron to do what we do. Aaron Wiesenfeld was great to work with. He was a full-blown superstar within a very short time. They paired me up with him because he liked drawing the gear. He liked drawing stuff that looked real. I think the idea at Wildstorm was to make a more real environment than typical superhero stuff. It wasn't going to work unless the military stuff looked right and looked accurate, and Aaron was really good at that. He fits this role of the hero-style drawing, and he drew every crazy thing I asked him to draw. It was a good collaboration. I really enjoyed working with him, and it was kind of lightning in a bottle. He was just coming up, and here I wrote his first long-form comics piece." End quote. Wow, a scoring praise from the writer of the uh, concept itself, you know, and I agree. Dixon and Wiesenfeld made an awesome team, you know, and it shows in the work. Here's what J. Scott Campbell had to say. I remember when Aaron was turning in those pages for Team 7. There was a lot of buzz about what he was doing and how interesting those pages were. Everybody was excited to see the next page he was going to turn in. That initial Team 7 series, especially that first issue, really had the attention of everybody at the studio. Even his fellow artists and peers were taking notice of Wiesenfeld's rising talent. And I think that's a testament to Wiesenfeld just really uh, making an effort to distinguish himself more from that standard image style. And you know, Wiesenfeld's work, although he came in under, you know, the, um, under the guise of, you know, doing that type of work, it was quickly noticeable that, you know, he wanted to change that and he began just doing his own thing for the better. After the success of Team 7, Wiesenfeld really began to become noticeable in the industry in terms of his stock rising as an upcoming superstar. His talent definitely shone brightest for me in these two books right here. These are issues 1 and two of the Wildstorm anthology, the short-lived anthology called Wildstorm. Now, it was only four issues total in terms of the actual series itself. Uh, the first two issues contain not only covers by Wiesenfeld, but interior stories by him as well. Um, the other two issues, if I'm not mistaken, they actually have covers by Wiesenfeld, which are which are nice, nice covers. But, you know, for me, the, the jewel are these two issues right here. Um, definitely check these out. Hunt for them if you can. I think they are, uh, perhaps for me, uh, my favorite Wiesenfeld comics work, you know. And basically the story, it's um, <laughs> in the best way, it, it almost seems like what they would term an inventory story. Uh, inventory story is what they used to refer to back in the day as just something that they would have on hand, ready to go. Like say if uh, one of the monthly books shipped late or something happened to where there was extra space, you know, in a particular book, they would have like an eight page story ready to go just to fill that slot. And so these feel like 
These feel like inventory stories, but the work in it, I assure you, is definitely not. Um, the first issue, I believe, is inked by... Let's take a look in. The first issue is inked by Wiesenfeld himself. And he also wrote this particular story. And the story involves Death Blow um, coming across this um, mental patient. Now, we don't know that the patient um, is a um, deranged, you know, psychopath at first. And I say psychopath because basically um, he believes that he's an ancient warrior uh, rampaging and pillaging through these villages but he's actually going through the um streets of a modern day metropolis and really all of this is just a showcase for Wiesenfeld's talent burgeoning talent at this time and it's 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 something to see it is really something to see and uh, to add to the allure of it it's all in crisp pure black and white which was just it, it, it's amazing. It's it's amazing artwork. I think this is probably some of the most underrated uh, artwork of the decade that came out of Wildstorm. If you ask my opinion, you know I know a lot of people, and now 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 this may seem sacrilege, you know, but a lot of people you know really talk about you know Travis with. Uh, the Wildcats X Men Golden Age uh, crossover as being like you know definitely the high point you know for that period but i would argue that perhaps right behind it would be these two issues of wild storm with aaron wiesenfeld's artwork in it you know so definitely if you get a chance to check it out hunt these two issues down you will not be sorry that's wild storm issues one and two so it was in the late 90s that wiesenfeld actually ended up leaving Wildstorm proper and I believe he started freelancing and one of the freelance projects that he started um, was uh, Death Blow Wolverine um, in 1996 with his uh, collaborator Richard Bennett. Now I have the uh, paperback here, the paperback collection, but I also have the uh, two issues, uh, issues one and two of uh, Death Blow Wolverine and of the late 90s, I would have to say that these are some of the most beautiful comics to come out of that period. You know, because in the late 90s, I'll admit it, in the late 90s, there was kind of just a, a lull in terms of, you know, the, the artwork, you know, that was coming out. And there was a lack of excitement to me. Like, I was collecting heavily during that time, you know, but... A lot of it really wasn't from, you know, um, image, you know, it was more from the big two just because there was nothing really hidden, you know, in my opinion, you know, coming out from Wildstorm during that time. But I recall getting this particular crossover on uh, this Death Blow Wolverine and thinking just, man, this this is just gorgeous work. It's just gorgeous. And I wonder if um, two things. Um, one, my reading tells me that uh, Wiesenfeld and Bennett both started attending Art Center College there in California um, around 96, maybe going into 1997. Um, because the artwork in his book is really open. You know, there's less and less much less of that standard image house style um, present, you know, in this work and more just clean lines. It's almost that lean Claire style, uh, European, you know, um, in a sense, you know, just get really this open aired feel of San Francisco itself and, you know, just really seeing just these, you know, wide vistas. And also in terms of the action too, you know, the action that Wiesenfeld and Bennett you know, portray within the panels is is exciting and it's uh, just just so open and it flows so wonderfully. The storytelling is wonderful. Um, if I recall correctly, I think this uh, series was actually nominated for an Eisner Award. Um, now, it did not win except for, I believe, Best Coloring. Um, Richard Bennett's wife, Monica, helped out with the coloring on this and um, they won for that, but I think they probably should have won really for best 
limited series or something like that because this is just an underrated series, you know, uh, underrated mini. And I think that a lot of people slept on it at the time. Um, it's definitely some of Wiesenfeld's most beautiful work. Um, and it, and it seems to me that, um, they kind of took turns with the particular issues, you know, with, um, Wiesenfeld drawing the, uh, first issue and Bennett penciling. And then you see, um, Bennett penciling issue two for the most part and Wiesenfeld inking it. You know, you can just tell like little nuances in the uh, artwork itself, but it still works as a cohesive whole, you know, and I think that it's worth your time to track down. Um, it's definitely something in Wiesenfeld's comic book um, body of work, you know, that's an essential. Um, and it's just a, it's a neat story to boot. Um, and definitely some of the most beautiful comics um, that you'll come across from the late 90s. Uh, that's Deathblow and Wolverine from Image Comics um, with uh, Marvel Comics. Get the uh, paperback. Or you can get the uh, two issues. And you can find them for cheap. Check them out. All right, and then we come to the early 2000s. Wiesenfeld, um, this, this, this was around the time that he started doing more fine art and going into uh, gallery painting. Although he was still doing some comic book related projects. Like I know that he was doing covers for the Crusades, the um, series by uh, Steven Siegel and artist uh, Kelly Jones that I loved. Uh, he was also doing, I think he did a short story in Batman, in the issue of Batman Black and White. It was um, the first time that I had started to see, you know, him doing really painted stuff and it was all in grayscale like you know ink wash and charcoal you know and um i was like wow that, that for for me it was jarring because i was used to only you know seeing his ink work so really to see him try something new you know it was just like oh, man okay all right that that's pretty cool now admittedly i wasn't completely sold on it but I was like, it's good to see him trying something new, you know, and it was great to still see him around in the industry. And then just thereafter, it was like months, like it was a while before I, I saw anything else of him. And so um, I believe in 2002, 2003, um, he came back with writer Jonathan Peterson for this um, truncated miniseries called Guardian Angel. Um Guardian Angel, basically, um, I believe they intended it to be an ongoing, but for whatever reason, they stopped at issue number two, you know, and in here, there's some of that Wiesenfeld magic that I love just in terms of the inking and the um, layout and the pacing and the storytelling, you know, it's just something special going on here. Um, admittedly, I will say that a story is not any great shakes, you know, and I think that's just due to it just being so shortened, unfortunately, but what is here, you know, is definitely a showcase of, um, Wiesenfeld's late period work in terms of his comics. And, um, you know, I think it's worth your time to track down if only to have these as part of as part of your uh, Wiesenfeld collection, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think the work in here is great. Um, it definitely showed that even though this was perhaps uh, Wiesenfeld's swan song in terms of, you know, comics work, um, interior work, you know, he still had it. And I think to this day, if he wanted to come back, he still could do it, you know? And Guardian Angel is a testament to that. Um, I think it's worth your time. Like I said, um, track them down, you know, if only for your curiosity for that late period, uh, Wiesenfeld work. But, um, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame that it was, um, you know, that it ended so soon, you know, after, after its launch, you know, I think, you know, um, uh, Wiesenfeld and Peterson had something special here and I, you know, wish that it, it could have, you know, continued. Well, that's all I have for you on this episode of Blurred It Out. I hope you enjoyed this look back at Aaron Wiesenfeld's brief but stellar comics career. He's one of my favorites, and I'm hoping that after you check out some of his work, he'll be one of your favorites as well. I'm Asian Johnson, and this is Blurred It Out. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks.